These are the answers to the chapter six packet, Electronic Structure of Atoms. Section one, the wave nature of light. The speed of light in a vacuum is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. The distance between two adjacent peaks or troughs is called the wavelength, and the number of complete cycles that pass a given point each second is called the frequency. Equation 6.1 on page 208 looks like this. C stands for the speed of light, and that's again 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The symbol, the Greek letter lambda, represents the wavelength, which is normally measured in meters, and the Greek letter nu represents the frequency, which is normally measured in hertz or inverse seconds. In this table, if we have to go from units of nanometers to meters, we're going to divide by 10 to the 9th. So 3 times 10 to the 9th nanometers is equivalent to 3 meters. 580 nanometers is equivalent to 5.8 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Violet light has a wavelength of 400 nanometers or 4 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. And x-rays one nanometer that becomes one times 10 to the negative nine meters. So if we have to go from units of meters into nanometers, we're going to multiply by 10 to the ninth. So for microwaves, the wavelength would be three times 10 to the seventh nanometers. For infrared light, three times 10 to the four nanometers. Ultraviolet light would be 200 nanometers. And gamma rays would be 0.001 or 10 to the negative 3 nanometers. Now for the conversion from wavelength in meters to frequency. We're going to take the speed of light and divide by the wavelength in meters. So for microwaves the frequency is going to become 1 times 10 to the 10th Hertz. For infrared light 1 times 10 to the 13th Hertz and then yellow light and violet light, ultraviolet light, and gamma rays. We're just doing that same math on our calculator. So the speed of light divided by the wavelength in meters. For the last little bit of information, we have to go from frequency to wavelength. So we'll still use the speed of light, but dividing by the number for frequency gives us 6.5 times 10 to the negative 7 meters, and that's the wavelength of red light. That's equivalent to 650 nanometers. You'll notice that as you go from top to bottom in this chart, wavelengths are, in, are decreasing, they're getting shorter, but frequency is increasing. So it's an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. So now we move on to section 6.2, quantized energy and photons. In your textbook, they define a quantum as the smallest quantity of energy that can be emitted or absorbed as electromagnetic radiation. On page 210, equation 6.2 looks like this. E stands for energy, which is normally measured in joules. H represents Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules seconds. And as you know, frequency is hertz or inverse seconds. Because energy can be released only in specific amounts, we say that the allowed energies are quantized. This means that their values are restricted to certain quantities. So now we have to convert either from frequency to energy or from energy to frequency. So we'll go ahead and either multiply or divide by Planck's constant. If we're going from frequency to energy, we'll multiply by Planck's constant. And as you can tell, these numbers are getting larger because the frequencies are also increasing in value. So a direct relationship between frequency and energy. And we'll divide by Planck's constant to go from energy to frequency. So looking at these numbers, we can see that there is a direct relationship between frequency and energy. When a light of a certain minimum frequency is shined on a clean metal surface, the light can cause the atoms at the surface of the metal to lose electrons. 
This phenomenon is known as the photoelectric effect. Albert Einstein explained this phenomenon by describing the radiant energy as a stream of energy packets. Each packet or particle of energy is called a photon. Our bodies are penetrated by x-rays but not by visible light. This can be explained because x-rays have a shorter wavelength, a higher frequency, and greater energy than visible light. Notice that they don't have a faster speed because they're traveling at the same speed, the speed of light. Alright, so letter H is asking us to calculate the energy of a photon that has a wavelength of 400 nanometers. First, let's convert nanometers into meters. And we know that one meter is equal to 10 to the ninth nanometers. So 4 times 10 to the negative 7 meters, that is our wavelength. Now we have an equation that relates wavelength and frequency. We also have an equation that relates energy and frequency. If we combine these two equations together, we can actually make it look like the following. So instead of saying h times frequency, since frequency is speed of light divided by wavelength, energy is equal to h times c divided by the wavelength. Let's go ahead and plug in our information. So Planck's constant, that's what h is, the speed of light, that's what c is, and the wavelength in meters, 4 times 10 to the negative 7. When we do this math, our answer will come out in units of joules, so 5 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Now your answer from part H represents the energy of a single photon. Let's convert this into kilojoules per mole. So from joules to kilojoules, there's a thousand joules in one kilojoule. And then there are Avogadro's number of photons in one mole. And when we do this math, we get 300 kilojoules per mole. In part J, we have to decide if this particular form of light with a frequency of 400 nanometers, would this be sufficient to cause sodium to lose its electrons? Well, the answer is no. And the reason why is because we talked about the fact that 300 kilojoules per mole was in fact the answer to part I. And since 300 kilojoules per mole is not high enough compared to 496, this light would just shine on the surface, but it would not cause any of the atoms to lose their electrons. Now we're going to calculate what would the wavelength have to be to make that happen. Let's convert 496 kilojoules per mole into wavelength. Here's how we do that. We'll convert from kilojoules to joules. Let's multiply by 1,000. And let's consider that joules per mole, now it must be joules per photon. Remember that there are Avogadro's number of photons in one mole. When we do this math, we get a very small number, 8.24 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Let's take the equation that relates energy and wavelength, and let's solve for the wavelength of light that would be associated with 8.24 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. When we plug in our numbers for Planck's constant and the speed of light and the energy value, we get a wavelength of 2.41 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. That's equivalent to 241 nanometers. Anything shorter than 241 nanometers would still be sufficient. Anything longer than 241 nanometers would not have enough energy to ionize. So I guess technically I should have said calculate the maximum wavelength of light because it can be less than that, but it should not be greater. Now moving on to section 6.3, which is entitled Line Spectra and the Bohr Model. Part A says that when a narrow beam of white light is passed through a prism, a continuous spectrum is produced. This is a complete rainbow of colors from red to violet. When a high voltage is applied to a glass tube containing hydrogen gas, a pink light is emitted. When this light is passed through a prism, 
only a few wavelengths are present in the spectrum, this type of spectrum is called a line spectrum. So in your textbook, figure 6.9 is showing you a continuous visible spectrum. So we have all the colors of the rainbow. But you'll also notice in your textbook, figure 6.11, here are the line spectra of hydrogen and neon. So you see individual lines of color. When scientists first detected the spectrum for hydrogen in the mid-1800s, it contained only four lines in the visible portion of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Calculate the frequency and energy associated with each line. We can do this because we know the relationship between wavelength and frequency, and we know the relationship between frequency and energy. So we'll use the speed of light divided by the wavelength in meters to calculate these values for frequency, and then we'll use Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency that will give us the value for the energy in joules. To explain the line spectrum of hydrogen, Niels Bohr assumed that electrons in hydrogen atoms move in circular orbits around the nucleus. Bohr based his model of the hydrogen atom on three postulates, only orbits of certain radii corresponding to certain specific energies are permitted for the electron in a hydrogen atom. An electron in a permitted orbit is in an allowed energy state, it does not spiral into the nucleus, and as the electron changes from one energy state to another, energy is either emitted or absorbed. Based on the diagram at right, should an electron that travels from n equals 2 to n equals 1 absorb energy or release energy? An electron that travels from n equals 2 to n equals 1 will release energy because the electron is moving from a higher energy level down to a lower energy level. The integer n, which can have whole number values of 1, 2, 3, etc., is called the principal quantum number. As n increases, the radius of the orbit gets larger in size. The lowest energy state, n equals 1, is called the ground state. And when an electron is in a higher energy state, it is said to be an excited state. And we're just talking about a hydrogen atom, which only has a single electron. When an electron moves from level 3 to level 2, red light is emitted. If an electron moves from level 2 to level 1, a certain form of light is emitted. Is this light in the infrared region or the ultraviolet region? So we know that the gap between level 2 and level 1 is larger. The energy difference is larger than the difference between level 3 and level 2. So the light that would be emitted must have higher energy than red light. Since ultraviolet light has higher energy than visible light, then ultraviolet light should be emitted when an electron moves from level 2 to level 1. The Bohr model of the atom has its limitations. It cannot predict the line spectra for other atoms besides hydrogen, and it does not account for the wave-like properties of electrons. However, Two important ideas that were introduced by the Bohr model are still incorporated in our current model of the atom. Electrons exist only in certain discrete energy levels, which are described by quantum numbers, and energy is involved in the transition of an electron from one level to another. So the next section in your textbook is section 6.4, the wave behavior of matter. I'm not going to cover the information in that particular section because these topics are not emphasized in the AP Chemistry curriculum. So on to section 6.5, quantum mechanics and atomic orbitals. Schrodinger's wave functions help us to map out a region in space in which an electron can be found. We do not know the exact location of an electron. Instead, we can only know the probability of finding an electron in a certain area around the nucleus. The solution to Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom yields a set of wave functions called orbitals. The lowest energy orbital in the hydrogen atom is called the 1s orbital, 
and has a spherical shape. The principal quantum number n can have positive values of 1, 2, 3, etc. As the value of n increases, the orbital becomes larger in size, and the electron has higher energy, and the electron becomes easier to remove from the atom. The next quantum number to talk about is the angular momentum quantum number, which is to describe the orbital in terms of its shape. So we have s orbitals, which are spherical. We have p orbitals, which have a sort of figure eight shape, like as if two balloons are attached together. And then we have more complicated shapes with lots of lobes of electrons. That would be letter d and f. So these are the four types of orbitals. And the angular momentum quantum number will tell you s, p, d, or f if the quantum number is equal to either 0, 1, 2, or 3. So when the quantum numbers are n equals 1 and l equals 0, we have a 1s orbital. If n equals 2 and l equals 0, we have a 2s orbital. If n equals 2 and l equals 1, we have a 2p orbital. So there is no such thing as a 1p orbital or a 2d orbital. At level 3, we can either have 3s, 3p, or 3d. And if n equals 4, we could either have 4s, 4p, 4d, or 4f. You should be able to find these type of orbitals in terms of the subshell on the periodic table if you know where to look. The collection of orbitals with the same value of n is called an electron shell. If they have the same values of n and l, it's called a subshell. If you have n for your principal quantum number, then that's exactly how many subshells you have. So there's only one subshell when n equals 1. If n equals 2, you have two subshells. If n equals 3, you have three subshells. And if n equals 4, you have four subshells. You should know that s orbitals have a spherical shape. p orbitals look like this, and there are three varieties of p orbital. D orbitals look like this, and we have five varieties of D orbital. And F orbitals look like this, and we have seven varieties of F orbital. Each orbital can hold two electrons. So two electrons can fit in the S subshell. Six electrons can fit in the P subshell. Ten electrons can fit in the D subshell. And 14 electrons can fit in the F subshell. The only other point about orbital shapes and sizes that is necessary to mention here is that as the value of n increases, the orbitals get larger in size. So a 3s orbital is larger than a 2s orbital, which is larger than a 1s orbital. All right, now on to section 6.7, many electron atoms. In a many electron atom, the electron-electron repulsions cause the various subshells in a given shell to be different energies. For a given value of n, the energy of an orbital increases with increasing value of l. So p would have a higher energy than s in a given subshell. d has a higher energy than p in a given shell. All orbitals of a given subshell have the same energy. And the term for such orbitals is degenerate. According to the Pauli exclusion principle, an orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, and they must have opposite spins. Section 6.8 is entitled Electron Configurations. The term electron configuration refers to the way electrons are distributed among the various orbitals of an atom. The most stable electron configuration is called the ground state. And when electrons are paired in the same orbital, they have opposite spins in the same orbital. The orbital diagram for nitrogen should contain seven electrons, and we use arrows to represent electrons. The Pauli exclusion principle says that there can only be two electrons in the 1s orbital, and we show opposite spins by using an arrow pointing up and an arrow pointing down. Similarly, the 2s orbital holds two electrons that are spin-paired, 
And then we have three more electrons, but because each orbital has the same energy, Hund's rule says that we have to put a single electron into each orbital on that same subshell before we put a second electron into the orbital. So each orbital gets a single unpaired electron. How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? It has five valence electrons because we count the total electrons in the S and P subshells because they are both considered the outer shell, level two. It contains three unpaired electrons. Those are represented by the single arrows. As far as writing the electron configuration for these elements, let's go find them on the periodic table and then see what it's gonna look like. So here we have oxygen, which is going to be 1s2, 2s2, and then 2p4. That's where that stops. We can abbreviate the 1s2 part with the noble gas helium, and oxygen has a total of six valence electrons. For magnesium, which has 12 total electrons, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then finally 3s2. We can abbreviate everything up to 2p6 with the noble gas neon, and magnesium has two valence electrons. Silicon has a total of 14 valence electrons, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then finally 3p2. It has neon in brackets, then 3s2, 3p2, that's four valence electrons. Chlorine has 17 valence, or sorry, electrons total, 17 electrons, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then finally 3p5. And chlorine has neon, 3s2, 3p5, so seven valence electrons. Potassium is located at the beginning of period four, so a total of 19 valence electrons. The last part is 4s1. We can put argon in brackets. It has one valence electron. Now we come to gallium, which has 31 total electrons. So gallium has everything up through argon, then 4s2, 3d10, and 4p1. And I tend to put the 3d10 first, and the 4s2 and the 4p1 last, but you could write that either way. If you wrote 4s2, 3d10, 4p1, that would still be correct. Gallium only has three valence electrons, not 13, because we don't count the 3d subshell as the outer shell. We only count the highest principal quantum number, which means s and p are only the electrons that we look at in the highest principal quantum number. Finally, we get to arsenic, which has 33 electrons. It's gonna look similar to gallium, except that now it has 4s2, 4p3. That's five valence electrons, not 15. We're just focusing on the s and the p subshells that have the highest principal quantum number. Finally, we're gonna fill out in section 6.9 how electron configurations can be determined by looking at patterns in the periodic table. So this is the S block of the periodic table, and the period that you're in represents the energy level. This is the P block of the periodic table. Again, the period that you're in represents the energy level. But in the fourth period, we actually have to include 3D. So it's not 4D until you get to the fifth period. So we're one energy level less than the period you're in. Finally, down at the lanthanides and actinides, that would be considered 4F and 5F. So when you know these patterns, you can find the electron configuration for any element, and I think you should find that to be a pretty straightforward process. All right, well, that's it. That's the end of the Chapter 6 packet. I hope that that was helpful, and good luck studying. Thanks for watching.